He knew a lot of people. He was an attorney and a politician. And a lot of his friends and a lot of his neighbors were on this battlefield. So if there's very little recorded about Lincoln's reaction to Shiloh, there should never be any doubt that he was very closely connected to this battlefield through his friends and family. Uh, the program is called, I believe, Lincoln and Shiloh, unless I brought the wrong program. <laughs> um, one of the things that one of the things that makes me really happy about these folks here at Shiloh National Military Park, and I did have the privilege myself to work here a few years ago as a seasonal ranger, is that they call me every January or so and say, do you want to do some more hikes this year in April? And I say, yeah. They say, what do you want to talk about? To me, I take that as a dare. <laughs> I take that as kind of a dare. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'll get back to you tomorrow and tell you what I want to talk about. So I get together a bunch of programs, and most of them are programs I know that they'll want to do, and uh, a few of them are dares, and a few of them are stuff that I just know. Uh, there's no way they're going to think anybody wants to hear that. So uh, this year I wrote down all my programs, and then for the last program, uh, I wrote down, um, why don't we discuss the six elements of the Euclidean proposition as part of the anniversary hike? and how those affected the writings and political arguments of President Abraham Lincoln and how that related to the Battle of Shiloh. Imagine my shock. <laughs> Imagine my shock and surprise when they said, okay, you think you can do it, Bjorn? Why don't you do that? Now they're daring me. Darn it. Now I have to learn the six elements of Euclidean <laughs> proposition. Now I have to go back to debate club. Now I have to go back to learning about how we argue, how we debate, how we decide things amongst each other, and what is true and what is not true. And how this relates to Shiloh. Shiloh is history. When we study history, what is true and what's not true is a important question. So, I went ahead and decided to develop this program for you. First thing I did was, of course, run right to Roy Basler's collected writings, the collected papers of Abraham Lincoln threw it up into the index and it said, I'll pick up the low hanging fruit first. I'll, I'll get all of Lincoln's mentions, all the times that President Lincoln talked about the Battle of Shiloh, uh, all the times he wrote about the Battle of Shiloh, and I'll include that. And I opened it up to the index, and I opened it up to S, and I went, ah! Not one. <laughs> Not one entry on the Battle of Shiloh. Quick, go to P, P, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. One. There is one. In all of Lincoln's writings, there's one reference to, shot to the Battle of Pittsburgh, and that is in a letter that you may recognize, a letter about General U.S. Grant. And that is when Lincoln wrote, shortly after the capture of Vicksburg, Lincoln wrote a letter where he, uh, he said, you know, everybody was really on me, uh, on me over Grant after Pittsburgh. They wanted me to fire him because of drinking or something like that. And, um, and I decided to keep him, and that was the best decision I ever made. Okay, I got that one. But President Lincoln didn't really mention the Battle of Shiloh in any of correspondence, and he didn't, there's not too much out there about him talking about it, although he talked to a lot of people about a lot of things, including this topic. It does raise the question, when the Battle of Shiloh occurred, 
April 6, 1862. If he didn't write about it, what was on President Lincoln's mind? Well, it was a different commander than General Grant. It was a fellow that he had in charge of his Army of the Potomac in the East, a fellow by the name of George Britton McClellan. While General Grant was fighting this battle in Tennessee, General McClellan was fighting the battle of his backside in Virginia, sitting on his backside. He had a chair trapped to a ground somewhere in, in Virginia. No, it, Gen General McClellan was trying to put together what was to become the Peninsula Campaign, gathering a very large army in, uh, uh, on, the, on the peninsula there in Virginia, the James, James New York River Peninsula. And on the 6th of April, 1862, President Lincoln was en route. He was on a steamboat that day, en route from Washington to Fort Monroe to meet with his slow-moving general, uh, his methodical General McClellan, about uh, what he would do, what they would do in the East. Therefore, his mind and his correspondence and his public discussions with public people for all of those weeks were about General McClellan and how to get General McClellan to move and how to get that Union Army of the Potomac moving up the Virginia Peninsula. There is, though, this one very interesting story that came out of those times. Uh, I don't know the exact date, but it might have been April 8th, uh, April 7th or April 8th. President Lincoln arrived at Hampton Roads and had a meeting with General McClellan and General McClellan sent him on his way, sent the President of the United States on his way. Uh, General uh, President Lincoln decided to get on a boat with uh, General Dix and uh, I believe Al Admiral, uh, possibly Admiral Lee, that's what the, the, the or Admiral Goldsboro, or Admiral Louis Goldsboro, and go scout out a place called Sewell Point. Sewell Point is not too far from Norfolk, Virginia, and it's pointing out, uh, it's one of the last points there before the Chesapeake flows into the Atlantic. Like I said, it's not too far from Norfolk. And they sailed up to it, and the batteries, the defenses there at Sewell's Point seem to be deserted, and... Um, President Lincoln turns to one of the Army officers and he said, uh, that, that fort looks to be deserted. Maybe you should send somebody over there to, you know, take it. He goes, oh, well, we can't really go on. We don't have the boats. We, don't, we weren't planning on going over there. He goes, I believe, if I recall correctly, President Lincoln said, I believe I'll go over there. If you're not going to go over there, it'll be something, a joke to that extent. But it meant, why don't you actually go into, I'm the commander in chief. Maybe you should go and take that fort. And uh, they did land without any opposition, and some scouts took the fort or went in there and, and, and scouted it. Then they came back and they went back. And as near as anybody can tell, as near as anybody can think, that's the only time an acting commander-in-chief gave orders for a particular um, uh, battle, a particular military operation to be conducted if we don't include what happens on a fairly routine basis in modern times, where the president is in touch with uh, his uh, commanders in the field uh, via the, the White House. But all in all, the point I'm getting around to, there was a lot going on in a country at war in April of 1862, and even a stunning as these events were, and as stunning as we feel they were, the president had a thousand things going on, including having a much larger army than either of these operating in the immediate vicinity of the Confederate capital, and what was he going to do about that? So, Lincoln and Shiloh, he didn't provide me any easy, any easy answers. So what we are going to do is we are going to probably change the focus of this program to Shiloh and Lincoln. We're going to start on our battlefield 
and see where it relates back to the 16th president. And in doing that, we can put together uh, quite an interesting little program. It's not going to go very far. We can see as far as it's going to go in that direction, and we can see as far as it's going to go in that direction. So if your legs are tired, this is the program <laughs> for you today. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you suspect that maybe you don't have uh, the, uh, the patience to work through the six, the six elements of a Euclidean proposition and how it relates to Shiloh, uh, then uh, there might be something else going on too. But thank you very much for coming and joining me. I'm going to quickly count no noses, and then we're going to head on off in this direction toward the uh, Will Wallace uh, headquarters statue. All right. So, if we're going, if we're going to, uh, if we couldn't bring Lincoln to Shiloh, maybe we can bring Shiloh to Lincoln, uh, and we can do that. We can do that because before Lincoln was a, before Lincoln was the president, or before Lincoln lived in the East, of course, he lived in the West. Before he lived in the West, he lived in the South. When he lived in Illinois, he lived in a part of Illinois where people identified themselves as Southerners. Abraham Lincoln was, I argue, a Southerner. I think we need to think of him as a Southerner. I think some Southerners need to think of him as a Southerner from Kentucky. His family moved to Southern Indiana, carried him to South Central Illinois. Now, we have decided what is North and what is South and what is East and West in our lives, but in 1860, it was different. In 1860, Americans were still moving West. Americans were still pulling up stakes and moving from one place to another. And Southerners were moving west and northwest, and Northerners were moving west and southwest. And by the time Abraham Lincoln arrived in Springfield, Illinois, Springfield was a western frontier town peopled, founded, and peopled by people who had moved there from places like Tennessee and Kentucky and Alabama and North Carolina. So, uh, on one level, uh, we need to think in, so in some terms about Lincoln's southernness. Um, now, also, Lincoln lived in the eighth judicial, uh, eighth judicial district of <laughs> Illinois, and as such, was an attorney. And as such, he did spent most of his time riding the circuit. His uh, most uh, uh, most common job when he was uh, practicing law was as a circuit riding attorney. That means for several months of a year, he and a bunch of other attorneys and a couple of judges form a little caravan, and they go from town to town all over the circuit. When they arrive in town, everybody that has legal business walks to court on court day, they pick a lawyer, they pick another lawyer, the lawyers are friends and colleagues that travel together, sleep in the same bed that night, or the same hotel, same motel, uh, same tavern that night, people pick their lawyers, and on court day, the, uh, the lawyers are out there getting uh, cases settled, getting cases resolved. Now this is some very this is some retail law. This is a, definitely some retail lawyering. This is standing in the middle of a courthouse square, having somebody engage you to represent them right there, getting their case, walking across to the other side of the square, finding the other party and their attorney, who's also a colleague of yours, <coughs> and starting to negotiate. <coughs> starting to negotiate. And the last thing any of the attorneys want to do is get a couple of hard heads that land you in front of the judge. Because then you have to go inside where it's hot and argue the case in front of the judge, and then the judge has to finally render a decision that way. 
in order to make the law work in this circuit environment, where the law only shows up for one day every so often, it is crucially important. It is crucially important for people to negotiate and settle their differences. Crucially important. It was also an environment where there was very little cash. Everybody was writing everybody else IOUs all the time. And I write you an IOU, you give me whatever a horse, whatever it was I needed, and then when you need some cash, you give the IOU I wrote you to him, for whatever you need. And then one day she shows up with an IOU saying, Bjorn, pay up, I need cash. I go, I didn't, I didn't do business, they, what? And then you show me the, you show me the IOU, and if it was written properly, I owe it. If there's a problem with it, eh, maybe not. We might show up on court day looking for someone to solve our dispute. That's what court day was like. And that is where Abraham Lincoln learned to negotiate. That is where Abraham Lincoln learned the critical importance of negotiating between each other to solve their problems. Obviously, this isn't going to work for him for his entire political career. But he meets a lot of people. He listens to a lot of stories. He hears a lot of people. And he has this part of him might be innate, an innate ability to empathize with people and understand their point of view. And in so doing, he influenced a lot of the attorneys around him. Some of them were younger attorneys. Early in his legal career, a young Illinois attorney named William H.L. Wallace approached Lincoln and wanted to learn some things about the law. Wallace was a very talented young attorney and much in demand to be a law clerk. Now, and one of the job offers he got was from the firm of Lincoln and Stewart in Springfield, Illinois. And he went and he got to meet with Abraham Lincoln. He had met Abraham Lincoln several times before. Uh, but what he really wanted to do, he already knew he wanted to clerk for a judge in Ottawa, Illinois, uh, named T. Lyle Dickey, Judge T. Lyle Dickey. Certainly, Lincoln had, uh, uh, Lincoln had uh, uh, argued in Judge Dickey's court before, and uh, so that sounded fine to him. And W.H.L. Wallace took the job clerking for uh, T. Lyle Dickey instead of Abraham Lincoln. Now, as we know, as some of us know, I'll go ahead and share the story. While clerking for uh, T. Lyle Dickey, uh, Wallace met the judge's daughter, Ann Dickey, and um, he went off and he fought the U.S.-Mexico War, became a hero, became a hero at the Battle of Buena Vista. How he became a hero at the Battle of Buena Vista is that uh, the 1st Illinois Regiment got out in front of the firing line. They pursued, they attacked the, the uh, Mexicans and uh, defeated some of them and pursued them too far until they got back <clears throat> behind the Mexican lines. Then the Mexicans surrounded them and attacked them. They had to try to escape. Lieutenant Wallace got a lot of the regiment, led them down through some arroyos, and got them out. Tragically, the commander uh, of the uh, of the first Illinois Infantry, um, John John Harden. Thank you, <laughs> John Harden uh, did not escape. The Mexican lancers uh, chased him down with a number of the other members of the regiment and killed him. John Harden was a cousin of Mary Todd Lincoln, and. A, fr a close friend of Abraham Lincoln, and uh, the con so therefore the connection between Lincoln and Hardin, and Lincoln and Wallace, and Wallace and Hardin led to a rather close friendship. A uh, rather close friendship, Wallace, Lincoln, Hardin, Dickey, they all knew each other. Uh, there's one intersection between W.H.L. Wallace and Lincoln politically, and that involved uh, during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, there was going to be a uh, uh, 
is going to be meeting in Ottawa. Uh, is going to be a meeting in Ottawa, and both candidates were going to be there, and uh, and it, it's in the. There was Wallace learned that the Douglas candidates, the Douglas people, had planned on uh, uh, meeting Douglas's train before it came into the station, and then forming a big parade, and then marching through town, and then when Lincoln arrived. They would steal his thunder, and you know everybody would be all the Douglas people. It would be embarrassing to Lincoln. So uh, quickly, Wallace jumped on the uh, uh, the telegraph and sent Lincoln a telegraph. And in pretty much typical Lincolnian fashion, Lincoln's reply pretty much amounted to, like, "Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it." And then Lincoln just showed up on a train and got off and walked walked to his hotel room and checked in. Uh, he, he walked right through the Douglas crowd. And, Checked into his hotel room, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, he Lincoln was a very political guy and a very savvy political guy, uh, but he had a, a way of skating right through the political noise and uh, and getting down to the debating part of what he intended to do. Will Wallace, friend of Lincoln, colleague of Lincoln, and the husband of Ann Dickey Wallace, they fell in love when he returned from the U.S. Mexico War. Were married. Set, he set up a, uh, a law firm there in uh, Ottawa. When the Civil War came, Wallace was already a war hero. He was one of the first people that Governor Yates would have chosen to lead a regiment. Governor Yates made him the colonel of the 11th Illinois Regiment. Uh, Wallace led the 11th Illinois Regiment in the very bloody battle at Fort Donaldson and uh, led them so gallantly that he was soon promoted to Brigadier General and given command of a division. Uh, in fact, I believe his promotion came through on the 2nd or the 3rd of April. He was uh, putting on his uniform for the first time to show his wife, who had arrived to surprise him at Pittsburgh Landing on the morning of the 6th. Instead, the battle started. He had to go to the field instead of going to the landing to visit with Anne. And the next thing that Anne heard was... Uh, at the end of the day, she spent the day tending to the wounded as the battle came closer and closer, raging across the landscape. She spent the day tending the wounded, and then uh, late in the afternoon, her uh, uh, a family friend came onto the boat and said to her, "You know, Mrs. Wallace," and he seemed sad, and she seemed uh, uh, she seemed concerned. She said, "Yes, he he didn't know how to break the uh, news," and he. Uh, he said, uh, you have many family members on this field. And she said, yes, it looks, but it looks like the tide is turning. We might win. And he said, you cannot hope that they all shall come through safely. And she paused. She thought about it. She replied, my husband is dead. And indeed, Will Wallace had received a mortal wound out here in the, uh, out here in the hornet's nest area. He was alive at that moment. His body was recovered. His, he was recovered the next day, um, alive, carried up to Savannah, and that is where he died with Anne uh, some, a few days later. So these are all Shiloh stories. Some of these are Shiloh stories we're quite familiar with, but we have to remember we're dealing with people that came from Lincoln's land, Lincoln's neighborhood. We have to realize that Lincoln got around. Lincoln was attorney. Uh, he knew a lot of people. He was an attorney and a politician. And a lot of his friends and a lot of his neighbors were on this battlefield. So if there's very little recorded about Lincoln's reaction to Shiloh, there should never be any doubt that he was very closely connected to this battlefield through his friends and family. Let's move on back toward the visitor center. There's a cavalry monument right there. Yeah. We're going to see some interesting names. First and second battalions of the 11th Illinois Cavalry, commanded by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Now, whether Ingersoll and Lincoln knew each other personally, Robert Ingersoll and Lincoln knew each other personally, 
I don't know for sure. I think they did. Robert's brother, Edward, was a close associate of Lincoln. Edward and Robert Ingersoll were very strong abolitionists uh, living in a southern sympathizing section of, uh, of Illinois, a, uh, living amongst pro-slavery people. And they were newspaper editors. I know Rob, Robert Ingersoll was a newspaper editor. And, um, and, of course, he caught a lot of flack. But, of course, so anybody who's willing to open an abolitionist newspaper in a pro-slavery uh, part of Illinois is uh, very much in the, uh, in the uh, spirit of Elijah Lovejoy, a, uh, somebody with some pretty tough hide, pretty re ready to, uh, to fight it out. And, um, and uh, so Ingersoll became a uh, uh, commander of a uh, cavalry regiment that served here in West Tennessee. When the Civil War erupted, Ingersoll raised the 11th Illinois Cavalry. It saw action at Shiloh and Corinth. Um, after the war, uh, after the war and after emancipation, after the 13th Amendment, Ingersoll took up took up the practice or the philosophy of uh, agnosticism. Uh, he's an agnostic great agnostic, and decided since, if he, since he had already been an abolitionist in a pro-slavery neighborhood, now that slavery was done, he would be an agnostic in a neighborhood of evangelical, um, evangelical Christians during the Great Awakening, you know, the Second Great Awakening. And, um, but part of it was his experience in the war. And uh, his, Ingersoll's experience in the war really led him uh, question the existence of God, and he wished to go out and argue with people about the existence of God, and he was very eloquent, and he gave very entertaining speeches, and even the people that disagreed with him right down to their souls uh, loved to crowd in and see Robert Ingersoll's speeches. And so he became quite a, uh, quite a famous philosophical character, quite a famous character in the philosophical history of the nation after Shiloh. Doesn't play much role in the Battle of Shiloh because cavalry did not play much role in the, in the Battle of Shiloh. Over here we see the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 4th Cavalry commanded by Colonel T. Lyle Dickey. Colonel T. Lyle Dickey, the boss of... William H. O. Wallace, and the father of Anne Dickey. Uh, also, her brother was part of that. Judge Dickey, a colleague of President Lincoln. And then if we come around here, this is the final one, the first battalion of the 4th Illinois Cavalry was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel William McCullough. Lieutenant Colonel William McCullough, another pre-war legal colleague of Lincoln. He was, in fact, the uh, leaving his uh, county clerk for the South County, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but he was a county clerk, a legal clerk for one of the uh, counties that Lincoln practiced in. Now, McCullough was a self-taught, like Lincoln, a self-taught legal man. Didn't practice law, uh, but uh, he was he was a politician, appointed politician in in the legal profession. Uh, had earlier in his life lost an arm to uh, in a farming accident, and uh, self-taught, uh, famously gruff uh, in his personal appearance and his personal uh, uh, demeanor. Uh, but he had a, a lovely family and uh, and a little daughter. That adored him, and um, so he managed to get a an appointment.
appointment in the 4th Illinois Cavalry. He survived the Battle of Shiloh, like almost all the cavalrymen did. Um, but in December of 1862, he found himself in Coffeyville, Mississippi, just north of Coffeyville, Mississippi, during a campaign where General Grant was trying to go overland from West Tennessee to capture Vicksburg. As we all know, he later had to go down and use the river to capture Vicksburg. But the attempt in December 1862 for an overland campaign against Vicksburg brought Colonel McCullough and part of the 4th Illinois Cavalry just north of Coffeyville, Mississippi, where they participated in the Battle of Coffeyville. Anybody here ever go to Coffeyville to see the Battle of Coffeyville? I've seen it, but I've been there. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a fine little town. They don't have much of a battlefield. There was much of a battle. But it, the important part of the battle, one of the important parts of the battle was this. There was some skirmishing all day between some Confederate cavalry and some Union cavalry, and that went into the night. And into the night, orders came for the 4th Illinois Cavalry to make a reconnaissance toward Coffeyville, uh, toward a particular back road, uh, to find out if the Confederates had moved on or retreated. <laughs> Colonel McCullough led that reconnaissance. Colonel McCullough had by this time in the war established a reputation as uh, an officer who could sometimes be trouble. Uh, he had treated some southern civilians harshly, um, nothing involving too much violence, but some theft of property, theft of chickens, and so on and so forth to feed his men, and had received some reprimands from his bosses regarding that. But he was also a hard fighter and a brave leader, and he was in front of his cavalry regiment that night as they moved through a dark forest north of Coffeyville. He was well in front of his regiment in a silent, silent forest when he heard the clicks of several hammers being drawn <laughs> back on rifles. And then he heard someone demanding that he should halt and surrender and say nothing. The demand was that he should say nothing, so that the, presumably so that the rest of his reconnaissance would follow him into the trap. Well, <coughs> Colonel McCullough stood up in his stirrups and he shouted, Never! <laughs> and those hammers fell on a dozen and Colonel McCullough fell dead from his horse. His men from his reconnaissance turned tail and fled and lived to fight another day. They were not captured. Colonel McCullough certainly gave his life to save the men that were coming from behind him. Uh, so it was a dramatic way to die, but it was also a sad way to die. And like every other death on every other battlefield, it left behind a grieving family, left behind an adoring daughter, Fanny McCullough, 20 years old at the time of her father's death, and a friend of Lincoln. And pretty soon, Judge David, um, I believe Judge David Davis, a mutual friend, let Lincoln know that Fanny's grieving seemed to be longer and more intense than anybody had expected that they, in fact, they were worried for the young girl's health. And would the president do something to try to relieve her grief? It's a tough question to be asked, but of course he was the commander in chief and he was the man who sent, ultimately the man who sent William McCullough on that mission. So he wrote, December 23, 1862, Executive Mansion, Dear Fanny, it is with deep grief that I learn of the death of your kind and brave father, and especially that it is affecting your young heart beyond what is common in such cases. In this sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all, and to the young it comes with bitterest agony, because it takes them unawares. The older have learned ever to expect it. I am anxious to afford some alleviation to your present distress. Perfect relief is not possible, except with time. You, 
you cannot now realize that you will ever feel better. Is not this so? And yet it is a mistake. You are sure to be happy again. To know this, which is certainly true, will make you some less miserable now. I have had experience enough to know of what I said. And you need only to believe it, to feel better at once. The memory of your dear father, instead of agony, will yet be a sad, sweet feeling in your heart of a purer and holier sort than you have known before. Please present my kind regards to your afflicted mother, your sincere friend, A. Lincoln. 1862, Lincoln wrote this nine months after burying his 11-year-old son, Willie. So when he said, I have had experience enough to know what I say, he was telling the truth. So the Fanny McCullough letter, one of the most famous pieces of Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln's writing, is tied to the Shiloh battlefield by this bronze tablet right here. Colonel William McCullough, the man for whom Fanny was grieving, was here on this battlefield fought in this battle before giving his life at the Battle of Coffee. Let's move on to the cemetery. <laughs>